Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you have enjoyed and made the most of your um, breakout sessions. Uh, I had a chance to pop into a few of them and learn lots and also uh, got to meet some of the exhibitors as well. So thank you so much for participating, interacting uh, and making the most of the day. We're now moving on to our um, closing plenary and we have got a brilliant lineup for you, a diverse range of people working across the international development sector. Um, I will be introducing them all and then asking them all to say a few uh, opening remarks um, just to start us off. And then you'll notice at the bottom of your screen in the panel, you have uh, two little speech bubbles. That is the Q&A. I would really recommend that you type your name, the organisation you're from and a question that you have. And I will try to ask that um, in these online times. That is about as interactive as I can possibly try and make this. Um, I can't even do what I normally do, which is allow an awkward silence in a room until somebody finally um, flags and gives me a question to ask. But I can try and look at you all sternly until somebody does that. So don't make me do that. Be participative and ask questions and make the most of this. So if I can very briefly introduce the panel, we have Anne Burgett. Albrechtson, who has asked me to call her AB, which is very helpful to me, uh, who's Chief Executive of Plan International, Lisa John, Secretary General, General of Silicus, John Carstensen, Climate Change Lead at Mont MacDonald, and Caroline Rands, Climate and Energy Campaigner, Friends of the Earth Scotland. The purpose of the conversation is a call to action, thinking about how we can build back better, looking at the kind of key conversations we've had, how has COVID-19 affected the work that we do, how can we prevent it from stopping us creating the inequality and justice that we're all fighting for. So, AB, if I could go to you first with your opening remarks. Yeah, thank you very much, Talat, and it's, it's wonderful to be here today. Um, and what I want to try and do is to convey to you what girls and young women around the world in all the countries where, where Plan International works, and that's uh, close to 100, what they're telling us about the need to build a better normal um, and one that they have designed. So a group of girls got together, facilitated by us, to design a whole research project where they reached out to over a thousand girls in 99 countries about the change that they want to see in the world. And this week we uh, launched uh, that research and they took it to the UN General Assembly, uh, not in New York, but virtually um, in an open letter. And, uh, and you can find that um, elsewhere on the internet and Twitter and, else, and, and, and in different spaces. But the key message of course is that girls don't accept the lives that they already lived before COVID. And they certainly don't accept the lives that they have lived during it. And they are absolutely unanimously demanding that we create a fairer and more equal and more sustainable world. Um, as the next phase of the crisis takes shape, their ideas could start to provide the basis for a new global consensus that, that takes action on the issues that girls and young people care most about. One that prioritizes creating a gender equal world, reduces poverty and inequality and acts on climate change, not just talks about it. These are the issues that girls in the poorest rural communities in the cities um, are asking us to take action on. Um, a just recovery from, from COVID means creating economies and societies that are founded on equality and fairness, and girls and young women aren't ready to accept anything else. I personally think that COVID-19 has acted as a stress test for institutions and practices and assumptions about how the world works. The harmful gender norms that pre-existed COVID and gender-based violence allowed to flourish in all societies around the world have led to an absolute explosion of domestic abuse during lockdown and a projected 13 million additional child and early enforced marriages. Um, legacies of austerities and underinvestment have absolutely decimated public services uh, that were already creaking um, under the pressure of previous crises. 
and we're seeing this everywhere. This is not a developing country phenomena. We are seeing it all over the world. And it's affecting girls, um, education, services, protection, um, all over the world. Um, and the huge inequalities that exist already in the world have just been exacerbated with, of course, millions of families facing economic hardship as a result of the crisis um, and girls being forced out of school and into child marriage. So the crisis um, girls see, despite the hardship that they feel and, and the, the direct impact it's having on them, um, the crisis they see as a real turning point moment where we start to address all these injustices and listen uh, to girls and young women, put them at the forefront of our recovery efforts. Back to you. Thank you so much, EB. I was uh, nodding along furiously as a lifelong feminist and gender equality campaigner. Um, thank you very much for your input. Lisa John, could we go to you next? Thank you. So um, I, I'm, I'm representing Civicus here, and Civicus uh, has been working for the you know over a decade to systematically look at civil society trends across the world, and and we're certainly alarmed that the pandemic has been used by governments as an excuse to further restrict civic freedoms. Uh, so as if it was not bad enough that only three percent of the world's population lived in countries where they could freely express themselves, uh, freely assemble or associate. Uh, you know, emergency measures are now being used uh, to, to, to impose further restrictions on both organized civil society, but also on citizens in general. And, and what we're seeing is a, a remarkable resilience from human rights defenders on the ground in terms of really putting their lives on the line to call out misinformation, to call out surveillance, to call out censorship, and to really object to the way that em em emergency measures and emergency laws are being used to undermine democratic processes. And I think that's, uh, for me, the real, the real uh, crux of what we need to be engaging with uh, as a result of the pandemic and uh, in building forward better, right? Um, and for civil society in particular, and because a lot of the people uh, you know, in, in, in this room are, are particularly representing organizations or institutions uh, that work on global development and the sustainable development goals, I think what we've realized, and, and this is from a study we've done in 80 plus countries uh, to really look at how governments are supporting civil society in their effort to strengthen and sustain themselves. Uh, we already knew, for instance, that local organizations were reaching communities even before governments were in order to provide relief uh, and services. But what we're finding is that, you know, that kind of framework, a kind of a systematic framework to allow civil society to operate and thrive when they are needed the most is, is really not um, you know, being put in place across countries. So in terms of a call to action, I think we really need to come together to create an enabling environment for investment in civil society. We've talked a lot about an enabling environment for civil society to speak up or, or to organize, but if resources are, are the number one problem right now, include, I mean, mostly for small and uh, medium organizations, uh, a survey across Civicus members, for instance, uh, showed us that at least 40% of our members feel like they, ha they don't have the resources to continue to operate you know, beyond a few months. And only 20% have actually received the kind of flexibility we've been calling for from donors and intermediary organizations to repurpose their existing grants and to be able to do uh, more with their operating or core costs. So, so I think it really calls for one, our own community in terms of the development community and development uh, linked to donors to really walk the talk on being open, transparent, and flexible. So we do need to be allowing uh, you know, uh, individual activists, small and medium-sized organizations to determine where they want to work and where they want to prioritize their funding. Uh, the second really is, I mean, this really needs to be a catalytic moment for uh, you know, um, cross-sector partnerships for how we increase resourcing in civil society. And, uh, you know, the study that I spoke about earlier identified six key principles, and I, I, I won't go into all of them, but, but the three uh, that really stand out for me is we should not accept governments, you know, restricting and vilifying civil society when we actually know that they're the ones on the ground saving communities and, and saving lives and, and, and really being there for people. Uh, the second really is that we need to be very, very clear that operating costs for civil society are not 
uh, you know, an optional or an un, uh, you know, uh, un, uh, you know, a cost that nobody wants uh, to support. If you don't op uh, support the operating cost of an organization, the core cost of an organization, they're never going to be able to do the transformative work that we all assume needs to happen, but without wanting to, uh, you know, provide flexible funding to any organization. And the third really is that, you know, an enabled, a properly resourced and a properly networked civil society is an ultimate good for societies. And we need to hold governments, I mean, their feet to the fire in terms of saying, what kind of policies are you creating? What kind of incentives are you creating so that the private sector, publics, you know, all other stakeholders in, in societies are able to appreciate what civil society does and they're able to invest in them through, uh, you know, leveraging assets and endowments through, uh, you know, a global giving kind of uh, platforms, but also a local giving movement. And we, we really need now uh, civil society to not be completely dependent on grant-based funding or ad hoc income generation uh, type uh, programs, but really, you know, have the same level of access to national and global resources that businesses do uh, have. And I think that's, that's the call I'd really like us to see uh, taking forward uh, as a result of this discussion. Thank you, Lisa. Really excellent inputs there. And um, before we move on to our next um, panelist, just a reminder that you've got the Q&A function just at the bottom of the screen there. Please do put your questions in there and I will ask them to the panel who are really excited about surprises, I've been told. So go for it, ask questions. John Carstensen, if we could come to you next. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me congratulate the organisers on some really, really good sessions. I had the chance to uh, to listen in to, uh, uh, to a few of them uh, during the day and uh, it's been really exciting uh, conversations. Um, the building back better mantra has been around for years and we have seen it when natural disasters uh, and conflicts have struck that, that we have the, uh, the ambition and the intention of building uh, back better. But just like with the disasters and when conflicts happen, uh, the same has happened with COVID-19. We were caught somewhat unprepared. Um, and uh, we, have, uh, we have been able to respond just like we do when uh, there are disasters and, uh, and other crises that, uh, that happen. Uh, it's not always a flawless response, but we are relatively good at, uh, uh, at pulling our resources together as a global community and, uh, and, and do something uh, better. But unfortunately, we also tend to stay with our old habits. So we revert uh, very often to how we used to do things because that's familiar, that's, uh, that's what we know. We know very often that things didn't work uh, that well um, in, uh, in that system, but, but we tend to get drawn into that, often because we are not really fully prepared to address what building back better actually means, whether it's about um, uh, engagement rights or, or, uh, uh, or it's about uh, climate change. We, uh, we need to, uh, to advance that, uh, that preparedness. And climate change, for example, is upon us. It is happening. Um, and we know that it requires quite urgent change over a very short period of time. We also happen to know that we don't even have the prospect of a vaccine to look forward to um, uh, at, at some point in time. We do need uh, to make changes. And what COVID-19 has demonstrated, I think, is it has shown that we actually can do things differently. Like what we're doing right now is doing things differently. Not that long ago, we would have been on flights. We would have uh, uh, had a, a very large carbon footprint in order to come together and have a discussion. Um, but we have learned that we actually can do things differently. Working from home, meeting like this, um, we see car-free uh, streets and much more cycling and uh, I think an appreciation for, uh, for the outdoor life. Uh, so we, we have a lot of the solutions, uh, but it's about being very deliberate about that change. 
and it's it's been very interesting because I actually changed job in the middle of uh, of the pandemic. We had just gone into uh, to lockdown when I joined uh, Mark McDonnell, um, and um, it's been very interesting to experience an organisation making um, changes at, at different levels, both at an operational level and at a strategic level, and in a sense. The, the operational level was was forced upon the organization by um, by what was happening but it was also something that Mark McDonald wanted to change they wanted to introduce more flexible working and, and uh, all those things and we were we were just um, definitely forced by uh, by the the circumstances uh, to accelerate that process and what it has shown is, it does work. I mean, I haven't met any of my teammates uh, in the organization face to face, but we're still able to work together. It does require extra attention to, uh, to things like digital systems and, uh, and putting an emphasis on, on different things. Um, but it, it is possible if you are deliberate about it. And the other thing that Mark McDonald has, has also uh, made the most of that that is to say well there are a number of changes we would like to see in terms of our vision and other things that uh, now is actually a very good time to introduce that uh, that that change and using the uh, the uh, the changes that are in our personal lives and working lives and everything in our societies using that to re-emphasize some of those strategic changes, which, which is about uh, re-emphasizing the, the importance of a people-centered uh, outcome for whatever we do. I, I appreciate we are a, 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 a private and commercial uh, entity, but we have really uh, found that, uh, that purpose around a, a people-centered outcome as, as part of the change process. And it was something that Mark McDonald wanted to do all along, uh, but has, uh, as an organization, really used the, uh, the opportunity to try to do things uh, better. Um, so that's, that's just uh, an example of, uh, of that. But my, my, um, my plea, in a sense, to all of us is we really have to be deliberate about the specifics of the change we want to see. We need to, to dig into our knowledge of the, uh, of the specific changes. So, for example, when it comes to climate change, we, we know that we need to decarbonize our economies. We know that there are lots of, uh, uh, of things we need to do to be prepared for the impacts of, uh, of climate change. Um, so we have the knowledge, we actually know quite well what we need to do, and, and that is really what we need to build on. Thank you. Thank you, John. And last but by no means least, can I go to Caroline, please, from Friends of the Air Scotland. Thanks, Talat. Um, yeah, so I'm the climate and energy campaigner at Friends of the Earth Scotland, uh, but I've really been invited to talk today about the work that we're doing as part of Justin Green Recovery Scotland, which is a new um, cross-sectoral civil society campaign in Scotland that is bringing together progressive groups to, um, to call for and to campaign together, to work together for a response to the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic. Um, that prioritises the people who've been worst impacted, that protect our communities, our public services, that basically a response that fundamentally puts people and planet first on our way out of this crisis. Um, and I, I think actually just listening to, uh, to the others there, I was quite struck on how like wherever we are in the world or whatever the sphere is that we're working in, that actually the um, the calls and the issues and the kind of central things that we're asking for and that, that people from the ground up are asking for are, are really similar. It's, it's equality, it's tackling power, it's, uh, it's tackling vested interests, it's, you know, it's creating this fairer, more equal society for everyone wherever we are in the world and wherever you are in, in society. And 
the reason that so many groups I think came together under Justin Green Recovery. So there's there's over 80, I think nearly 90 now groups um, who signed up to support the campaign um, is because everyone has recognized that this is a crucial moment for system change. And Lisa was talking about this being a, a sort of catalytic moment for um, for cross-sectoral partnerships. And Justin Green Recovery does bring together people from across NGOs, trade unions, churches, grassroots groups, and working across a real broad range of issues. So we've got uh, international groups, including many of the folk who um, are here today, um, but and right down to mutual aid groups who've been providing emergency support for their neighbours, groups working on tax justice, well-being economy, tackling poverty and inequalities, gender justice, climate, food, health, housing, public services, like all coming together um, because we realise more and more, and, and the pandemic has really exposed this, that all of these issues are connected and that you can't tackle one truly without tackling the other. And this is a time for system change. Um, so Justin Green Recovery uh, started by kind of sitting down and writing a, a collective letter to the First Minister um, where we were forced across these different sectors and, and sizes of groups and types of groups to have this discussion about um, what is the future that we want? You know, what does it look like? What is the change that we're calling for? Um, and fundamentally what we're calling for is a kind of a reprogramming of the economy, if you like, away from the prioritization of economic growth for growth's sake um, towards goals of well-being and sustainability, calling for public services that work for people, not profit, calling for protecting the most marginalized people by redistributing wealth, ensuring that the recovery tackles climate and environment, strengthening democracy and human rights and participation uh, in the decisions that affect us, um, and international solidarity and equitable response to, to both the climate and the COVID crises. Um, and, and we know that the decisions that the Scottish government makes and the UK government and all governments <laughs> make in, in the coming weeks and months, they're going to shape our communities and our climate for decades to come. Um, but this is such a moment for change. And I think that, that there's been polling on polling has shown that the public are, are really wanting that change. Only 6% of the UK public said they'd be fine to go back to a pre-pandemic economy. Um, these conversations are out in the open now. It's really exciting to have them with everyone here today and, and they're happening up and down the country and around the world. And I guess, you know, we've got a future to win and, uh, and we, you know, change is possible. And I, I just think it's really exciting to be bringing all of these different um, factors together and thinking about how we win this future together. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you for that. We have had some questions in. And I know that um, EB has been swift off the mark and has already given a, an answer to one of them. That's great. But I'm going to give you an opportunity to answer um, for those who, who haven't typed up. So Simon has asked us, can any civil society group really hold government's feet to the fire the way that um, Lisa mentioned if the group is taking money from any government? For instance, in Scotland, the critical friend role of international development NGOs, which I, I I know well and I've been in that position constantly renegotiate that position constantly being renegotiated with the government because of funding and that feeling of whether you can fully challenge um, where the sustainable funding where the money for you to keep the lights on is coming from so um Abie's written uh, an answer there already Lisa if I go to you next and you can give me your take on that sure and I was looking at the second question too, but anyway, I'll, I'll come back to that later. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I, I think that's re very true. And, and, and I think it's impossible to, or, or it's harder to push back if you're doing it alone, but if you're working in a collective and you have your agreed position on civic space and the independence of uh, the civil society voice, it's, it's much easier than uh, to do that. And I, I think when you're looking at the fact that organizations and individuals are doing that even in the most highly restricted context, whether it's Saudi Arabia or China. I mean, there's absolutely no reason why we can't be doing that better in governments that are actually you know, more democratic and are willing to engage with us. Thank you. Um, Caroline, would you like to come in? Sure, yeah. I mean, this I, I've spoken to so many people in Scotland um, and elsewhere for whom this is a problem. Um, as friends of the Air Scotland, we actually don't have any government funding uh, and maybe that allows us to be 
um, a little bit more critical uh, because we're not having to renegotiate um, kind of terms and funding to keep ourselves going. Um, and for similar reasons, we, we don't accept funding from uh, sort of social corporate responsibility um, from the likes of BP or Shell. <laughs> but I think in terms of civil society, um, you know, it, it is often crucial for some of these groups to get government funding to do the really important work that they need to do. Um, and I think, you know, I just really echo what, what Lisa was saying is that when you work collectively and you work in collaboration and you come together, you create a power in civil society. Um, and I think we really need to be aware of the collective power that we hold um, and not be afraid to exercise that that power and demand the changes that are necessary. Um, and it is hard, and I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be in the position of of many of these folk who are, who are trying to be critical and on the other hand really need that funding to survive. But I think that really is the power in in coming together and making these collective demands. And even if you cannot say it publicly because your funding restricts you, you can be part of of a bigger call and a bigger group who are taking that message directly to power and taking it down to the grassroots as well. Right, right. And I think it's often, um, it's a power that should occasionally be tested because often uh, it's a feeling of we shouldn't see anything because of funding, but actually sometimes that, that can be tested. It certainly won't be written into a contract because a government, certain governments wouldn't be able to afford to do that. So I, I always think it's something worth testing and I have tested on a number of occasions. Um, would any of the other panel like to come in? Yes, yes, please, uh, Tanat. I, I think from from a private sector perspective, um, it's it's not always about applying pressure or or that kind of uh, of push on on governments. What I think that that we, for example, can uh, can bring to uh, to the table there is that we can actually help demonstrate what is possible. Um, uh, we will engage in, an, in a lot of, uh, of large-scale programs uh, that influence uh, people's lives and by having uh, the, the right attitude and the right values in, in a business we can actually uh, help demonstrate that you can do some of these things uh, differently. Uh, and uh, uh, that for us is is an important part. We we actually want to walk the talk uh, uh, as well. We want to demonstrate what we can do, for example, around uh, uh, climate solutions um, in uh, in the work uh, we are doing, and thereby hopefully influence the, the thinking uh, both of governments, but but also um, uh, of the population at large. Thank you, John. And um, I think this is also answered partly. Uh, David Patterson, you had a question about um, radical global change within uh, when you were getting money from big philanthropy and major government, which are invested in keeping the status quo. So I think we've, we've linked a, a, a much to that. But if anybody would like to respond to that in particular. So, you know, I think one of the things we've seen across this decade, we have an annual state of civil society report and uh, we're bringing out our 10th edition next year is that radical transformative change is not coming uh, adequately from formal civil society. So in a way, it kind of um, undermines the argument that if we get more funding and more sustained funding, there will actually be more radical change. Uh, and, and that's why the need to really question how resourcing is working and is it really tying us down and making us more narrow in our uh, focus and our outcomes. Uh, because all of the massive change we've seen in the last few years, uh, you know, in terms of changing uh, the narrative on climate, for instance, or regime changes in Sudan, or you know the Hong Kong protest movement, is coming from informal civil society, and it's coming from non-structured funding or resourcing. Right? They're not. I mean, it's it's very much a DIY kind of uh, uh, organizing, and I think it it really uh, forces us as organized civil society or formal civil society to really rethink and 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 focus where we want to put our energies and how best we support new social movements in their cause, uh, because, you know, I mean, there is that dynamic of, uh, you know, spontaneous social movements being able to really attract public and political attention to an issue, but the longer term policy changes requiring much more organized and, and formal, uh, you know, in, investment through civil society organizations or academic, academia or, or think tanks. And I think 
being able to push back then on being told what exactly you need to do with your resources is really, I mean, especially for uh, local organizations and organizations in, in the global south, absolutely fundamental and critical to the impact that we, we can make. Uh, because uh, because uh, 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 resourcing which is tied to uh, you know very top down outcomes or a very narrow lens of service delivery is just not helping anybody in the sector it's actually undermining our legitimacy uh, you know as a whole across the world and i think we need to really support each other uh, in challenging both donors and intermediary organizations uh, in the way that they kind of um, you know pin down or, or almost uh, you know have this kind of extractive relationship uh, with local organizations thank you Ethan. thank and, you, you know. i think um uh, there's a really interesting question and an important one that's coming from mary popple the worrying opposite view from us who are working together and have a certain viewpoint of the world is the rise of populism across the world which is pursuing self-centered thinking rather than collaborative and particularly in terms of race equality gender equality um, the distribution of aid and support. Um, how does the panel think we can overcome this? AB, can I go to you first for that very easy question, of course? Yeah, I wish I had an answer. <laughs> but the, uh, oh, I, you know, it lies in, it, it lies in that collaborative space that we have, that we've talked about. I wanted to, to sort of connect the first few questions in this as well, um, especially around, you know, working across different sectors, whether it's government or, or private sector and civil society, we have a collective interest, but we don't always articulate it like that to keep populism, extremism at bay. And we tend to sort of put ourselves in opposite boxes, or at least in separate silo boxes, private sector here, government there, civil society here. I mean, i I believe in my organization truly believes that some of the most impactful change that we have helped make has been when we broke down those silos and when we were able to take a collective message um, into a particular sector, whether it's the garment industry in Bangladesh or whether it's other parts of a supply chain or somewhere, we have been able to really impact the lives of thousands and thousands of, of workers and, and, and educators and students. So, so I think one answer to the question, not the full answer, but to keep populism at bay is to come together and speak out against it together. Um, I have found that, you know, speaking out on human rights together with the private sector has often had more impact, actually, than trying to stay together with all the human rights activists over here in a corner um, and, and name and shame the rest. One answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, did you want to come in there? Yeah, I am. Um, I was just scrabbling for a notebook in the back because I went to a really interesting webinar last week, um, which was uh, about framing climate justice. Um, it was a session which was put on by 350, the Public Interest Research Centre uh, and some others about how we, how we talk differently, like how we use our narratives and our frames to put forward an alternative story. And one of the really interesting things that they were talking about was in polling and in research groups, whenever they speak to people, people have a, a view of themselves, like everyone thinks of themselves <laughs> as being um, very caring, uh, very open-minded, um, having much more uh, kind of collaborative goals and they think of everyone else as being very narrow-minded, like quite selfish, quite greedy um, and these are essentially because of the stories that we are told, <laughs> the, the mainstream narratives that we get through media, through government, um, you know we I'm not going to repeat, but we know that there's really damaging frames and, and stories that are told about um, migrants, for example. Um, and one of the conversations that we were having there is about how do you change the discussion? Um, and actually that, you know, people are, at, they're, they're told these stories and they're told to fear these, um, fear others, fear other people. And that is a narrative and a story which is stoked by the far right um, and some of the far right are very very close to us now in the UK um, and I think we have a collective obligation I, I think as, as progressive organizations to challenge that narrative and not just to state it loudly but to explain to people 
why these links are important, why these people matter. Um, that actually, you know, one of the, the things that um, we often tell about the story of climate injustice is, uh, you know, just 1%, there was new research done the other day, just the richest 1% in the world are responsible for double the emissions of the poorest 50. So the poorest 50% doubled is, is what the richest 1% are responsible for in climate emissions and we need to, to tell more of these stories and explain more of these links um, because it's uh, we're living in someone else's narrative every day they're, they're designing um, these narratives for their particular outcome and, and we really need to to come together and, and combat that and it's it is hard <laughs> but it's um it's a challenge and it and we have the answers Yes, thank you. I've actually got, I've got a question for each of you, but you can only give me a one minute answer. That's the, that's the um, task. So I'm going to start off with Lisa. Lisa, what are Civicus doing around helping grassroots movements find their voice? So the very small that you mentioned, the informal groups, just in one minute. So solidarity funding, for sure. I, I think that's, and hard negotiations with donors, really getting them to walk the talk on flexible and core uh, support. Perfect, that wasn't even a minute. If I had a gold, <laughs> if I had a gold star, you'd I get can, it. Now I can talk about populism now. <laughs> <laughs> AB, I have a question for you. You've written and spoken about the importance of digital connectivity now more than ever. Uh, how can we overcome this inequality and how will it improve our chances of achieving gender equality? Uh, just a few facts to remember. Almost half of the world's population is still offline. We keep talking about digital solutions. Half are already left behind. Uh, men are 21% more likely to be online than women. And as we have seen under COVID-19, the girls and women that, that or, or young women that I was talking about before, many, 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 or most of them have said, um, we can't afford the data time. We can't join up. Um, on video and our big brothers or husbands uh, hog the time and our education went out of the window as soon as it went uh, digital. So that's the reality of the digital gender gap. Obviously, if we can close it by having more low cost solution, by expanding the net, by really focusing on leaving no one behind. And for us, in civil society, the activists, etc., making sure that, you know, not just the speaking points or the opinions or the voice, but the data time is probably the most, uh, the, the best gift you can give any activist uh, today because they need to be able to connect the way that we can connect. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. You can have a gold star too. John, a one minute reply to this question, which uh, I've just written down. So, is socially responsible business genuinely possible in the post-COVID era? Absolutely. Do you want me to stop there? Uh, I, I, <laughs> Give us some detail. Uh, I, I, I think it is, but it does require uh, the, the businesses to be very mindful uh, of their role and clearly articulate as part of their business vision, how they see the world and how they see their role uh, in, in relation to uh, an, an inclusive, supportive uh, uh, society. Um, and, and I think where, where businesses can help is that we, we, can, we can always be evidence-based in what we do uh, and I think that is a, is a strength that we can build on and, and really demonstrating that we understand how systems connect together. Uh, so the short answer is yes, the longer answer was, was there, hopefully still within a minute. You can have a silver star, that's fine. Um, <laughs> Caroline, um, thank you so much. So Caroline, so the campaign has garnered a lot of interest, like you, you were talking about, from lots of different uh, areas, not just those working on climate change. It is looking at mutual aid groups you were talking about. How does that compare to what's happening in other places? Um, are we seeing the same connectedness? Do, does Scotland need to do better on that connectedness? Uh, 
Yeah, so I think these conversations are really happening everywhere as far as I can see. Um, and um, I mean, maybe, and Lisa also hinted to some of that. Um, I think what we need to work on um, is having those same conversations happening in governments. Um, because what we saw in the response uh, to Justin Green Recovery Scotland was when we wrote to the First Minister um, and, uh, you know, we, we put this across on, on behalf of you know, this broad coalition of people, um, they, you know, they're not really sure what to, <laughs> what to do with it. You know, who does that belong to? What portfolio does that go to? Which minister is responsible for this? Um, and we see that a lot of the conversations that are happening in government are, are still in silos and we need to be pushing this onto the decision makers that this is an opportunity for big, broad, holistic, systemic thinking to create the change that's really needed. That's great, thank you. Now that I was timing you, but I'd guess about 58 seconds, so you're fine. Um, okay, so um, to sum up, because I think that's been really rich, really interesting. We've talked about a call to action. So if you'd like to just do a, a summary, and if you don't mind, Caroline, since you're on, we'll start with you and go backwards. And if you could give us a bit of a, a summary, takeaway points that you would like the audience to remember. Sure. So, um, yeah, I guess it's a call to action, um, depending on who you are on this call today. I would say firstly, for individuals, start having these conversations, start having these discussions around the dinner table with your family, with your community groups. What is the, the future that we want to see? And we talked about we're living in other people's narratives every day. You know, we need our own vision, our own imagination. What is that better, fairer Scotland that we want? Um, and once we have a vision of that, then we can really plot our way to get in there. Um, look out for uh, a week of action, which is coming the 4th to the 11th of November, week of action for Justin Green Recovery. We're going to be encouraging people to get in touch with their MSPs, to use this as a, a chance to highlight the, the, the differing but connected recovery demands. Um, so look out for that. That'll be coming publicly soon. Um, anyone that's on the call who are part of groups or organisations um, can join the campaign, get involved. And I think the, the critical thing I would say to, to people who are working in organisations is how, you know, think about how you can get out of your bubble. And I don't say that callously because it's very difficult. It's time intensive. It's a lot of relationship building. Um, but think about how you can reach out beyond your immediate sector. Um, to make the links across civil society because at the, at the root of it our our issues are connected um, and so the, the government folk on the call I, I say the same thing like we're hearing really positive words from government but we're seeing the inconsistencies and I think what the reality is that those inconsistencies are are undermining the positive progress that we're seeing um, people have talked today about policy coherence and you know, 6% of people are fine to go back to a pre-pandemic economy. That means 94% are not. Two thirds of people think that government should intervene to make a fairer, greener society. The same proportion of people um, think that we should move away from uh, prioritising GDP to moving towards a well-being economy. Like the public want this. The government have a mandate. Like let's, let's use this to be the, the moment for real change that it can be. Absolutely, Caroline, thank you. And John, a very brief summary. Yeah, I think the, uh, the need to be specific about the change we want to see is, is very important. But I also think for all of us, uh, it's important that we get out of our silos. We do need to work together to collaborate, and I know we can do it, and, uh, and there are plenty of examples of it. Uh, but those two things, be specific, break down our silos and look at what we want to achieve as a complete system and the changes that need to happen within that system. Thank you so much. Lisa, your very quick summary. So just to say that one of the most uh, powerful moments of this year was the emergence of feminist leaders at national, subnational and regional levels, right? And we saw that there are people in government who believe and who act on the same values that we do. So my one line call to action is hug your allies. I mean, if there, you know, change is not coming from just one part of society. It has to be intersectoral and intergenerational. This is the moment when we need to find and make friends and then we can move forward. Thanks so much, Lisa. And Abi, your final thoughts. 
Um, just building on all the wonderful calls to action that have already been said, love it. Let me focus on the intergenerational, make sure that it's not all us old folks that sit at the table, but get the, the kids and the young people in there at the center, not just as tokens, but really shaping the agenda. And then maybe as an old UN policy wonk, you know, we've got the sustainable development goals. We've built them together with government, civil society, private sector. It is our collective agenda. Let's not reinvent it. We have it. Let's translate it and make it come alive. Thanks. That was brilliant. I know that it was speedy, but I feel like we got through so much there. Thank you hugely to all of you for your expertise and your time. And uh, mostly when it comes to me, your passion. Um, that's what comes across and that's what makes something online feel less online. So um, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, it's now time for me to essentially close off the um, conference. Um, and I think I can just go straight on to that. Yes, I can. Uh, firstly, I would just like to start off by saying a huge thank you to everybody who has participated today, whether that's as participants that have been there diligently going in at, on time to each breakout session, or whether that is uh, our panellists, the minister today, those who are doing the workshops, session, the workshop sessions, uh, and of course those who are in the exhibition. A huge thank you for your participation. Thanks too to StoneX who um, supported and sponsored the conference to be able to bring it to life. A huge well done to the Alliance staff who have made this happen uh, and gave me the privilege of chairing. I really appreciate that. I've learned lots um, and the opportunity to be able to see people who care this deeply means a lot to me. So a huge, huge thank you. There's a couple of things that I need to tell you. Uh, on the um, tech change platform that the main conference was on, if you go to next steps, um, you, which will still be open after the conference finishes, there is a pledge which is us asking you what is your call to action, what is it that you are going to do um, as uh, people who have participated in this uh, conference, what have you taken away and what will you be doing next, so please do fill that in. There's also a feedback survey which will be sent out to you and is available on the um, online platform as well. Um, the purpose of today was to talk about Build Back Better and, you know, final thoughts for me, we've had brilliant input, but what I really want to see is Build Back Better not simply be something that we tweet about, it has to be, it can't be rhetoric, it has to be translated into action, whether we say Build Back Better, Build Forward Better, we're full of a lot of warm words, but warm words won't get us anywhere, action will. And for, what we have seen in COVID-19, as somebody who is an equalities campaigner, it is frustrating that it takes a global pandemic to see the realities of inequality that we have all seen every day in our working lives and in our own personal lives. It has exacerbated inequality, but now how we respond to that will be the making or breaking of us. Now, we have a pandemic, a global pandemic, but we had climate change as a pandemic before that. There is a response that is a responsibility as individuals, as those who are decision makers and governments and organisations. We can't respond simply by putting a plaster over a crack in the foundation when the foundation is broken deeply itself. What I would say is that this requires systemic change. It requires system view. We need to look at this and think to ourselves, what are the everyday interactions, the everyday changes that we're making that are actually embedded in tackling systemic racism, systemic sexism, economic injustice and climate injustice? What are we doing in our everyday work that is actually contributing to that? And as far as I'm concerned, it's accountability to decision makers. How are we in a position and putting them in a position where they are publicly held to account to do something differently? And finally, I would say the international development sector has an opportunity to also do some self-reflection and internal challenge on how us as organisations, us as campaign campaigners, lead by example when it comes to inclusion, progression, and who gets to share the platform and have the mic when we talk about the Global South in particular. So thank you hugely for being part of this. I found it hugely beneficial. Uh, let's do what we can to create the fairer and more just world we're all looking for. Thank you and have a great day.